You're watching Talking Point on Stat News Global. I'm Amitabh Brady. It's great to see Ambassador Kamal Sibal, India's foreign, former Foreign Secretary, again. Uh, thanks so much, uh, sir, for your time. My pleasure. And also from Washington is uh, Richard Rosso, is a senior advisor and the Vadwani Chair, U.S.-India Policy Studies at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rosso, for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Ambassador Sibal, uh, we knew the build-up to the Malabar exercises, just more details have been announced now in terms of the dates of the two phases of the coast of Vizag is the first phase, 36th of November and then mid-November in the Arabian Sea. Uh, how important do you see Australia being reinvited to the Malabar exercises and the Quad actually being uh, operationalized in the maritime domain at least uh, with these exercises, Ambassador? Well, this is important for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, Australia has been knocking on our door for some years now and the United States has been uh, openly and privately calling for the uh, inclusion of uh, Australia and the Malabar exercise. Uh, but uh, in view of uh, the past experience we had uh, in uh, 2007 when uh, Australia decided to walk out of uh, this exercise and in a, in a in a very undiplomatic manner, Kevin Rudd, standing next to the Chinese foreign minister, uh, decided to walk out in deference to Chinese sensitivities. And number two, uh, there was a feeling that uh, the Australian public opinion inside the country was highly divided. And it was not very certain whether there was a change in government between the conservatives and the liberals, uh, uh, that it could be a uh, or conservatives and whatever the other party is, yeah. that there could be a change in thinking and we could experience the same thing uh, again. And number three, which was much more important, was that was Australia trying to do this uh, in order to be part of the game uh, or mm -hmm. were they willing to bring in concrete assets uh, to the uh, core in the sense that uh, what will be the degree of information sharing, monitoring, uh, intelligence sharing, participation, deployment of uh, military capabilities, not only naval, but particularly yeah. uh, maritime surveillance capabilities, because many of the Chinese families uh, go through the Lombok and Sundar Straits, uh, and here Australia can be able. Uh, so eventually, uh, India lifted its reservations, uh, which is why I think. Uh, Australia's participation has political importance because India has recognized the value of uh, Australian uh, participation. Uh, that is why. But then this has been preceded by a general strengthening of India Australia relationship. Uh, last year, for example, the biggest ever India Australia exercise took place in the Bay of Bengal with about a thousand uh, Australian uh, naval personnel participating in, in the exercise. And even otherwise, the uh, the strategic partnership uh, between uh, India mm. and Australia, even, and beyond that, even in a trilateral format, there have been discussions in India, yeah. Australia, Japan, India, Australia, and Indonesia. So the moment was right. The second important thing is that uh, this has happened uh, at the time of the Chinese are sitting in the car. Uh, and uh, there is no forward movement in terms of disengagement and the escalation, mm. much less restoring the status quo ante. Um, India had been, I think, uh, a little careful about not giving the impression that uh, India was joining a military alliance because all the three, three other partners are military allies. And uh, China, as you know, initially, of course, uh, China has been very sensitive about this. And I think uh, there might have been a that let us not uh, uh, take steps which can make uh, negotiations and relations with uh, China still more difficult. But with the kind of thing that has occurred, unprecedented Chinese aggression in the back, I think the mental text were clear that the time has come to pay less attention to these sensitivities and uh, take this step and can give the signal to the Chinese that the more they misbehave, the more they have 
these aggressive domineering instincts, the more the countries that are concerned about this uh, will gather together, cooperate, and uh, put in place deterrent capabilities and curb China's that, uh, ambition. So I think that is the sense. Let me take that point, your last point too, Mr. Rosso. Now, uh, do you see this uh, calibrated as it has been the Quad uh, over the years? Do you see it speeding up because of what's happening with China in various dimensions in uh, India's uh, northern border with Tibet, of course, but in the South China Sea? Do you see it being operationalized, the military dimension of it? Well, there's, there's several ways you can operationalize a military dimension, and I think uh, exercises is one of the earliest ways you can do that. So, yes, it is becoming operationalized by the fact that we have exercises. Uh, the pace of the Quad and its kind of growth uh, has really accelerated in recent years. Uh, and I think, as Ambassador Sybil correctly pointed out, you know, the fact that I think most important that India and Australia really seem to be improving the bilateral relations, each of these individual legs that make up the four members needs to be strong for the four to act in some kind of, uh, you know, a coordinated manner. Um, and seeing the India-Australia relationship really start to, to blossom in recent years, um, I think it has proved uh, kind of the most uh, important unlocking feature for the Quad. Now, you know, an exercise is great, but, you know, if we think about it as continued evolution, you know, what sort of things does that look like? There are other military dimensions, you know, like the four countries working together on humanitarian relief. If there's another um, tsunami or some other kind of uh, humanitarian crisis in the region, you know, we've got a little bit of experience in that before, which was really sort of the dawning of the Quad 15, 16 years ago. Um, you know, you could see things like patrols or joint sailings, uh, things like that. Um, things that are relatively, you know, low on the scale of confrontation. Um, but then there's also a lot of things I think that the four countries can do that have non-military aspects that need to be explored. You know, I think you've seen Absolutely. both the United States and India take steps towards China's attempts to dominate the world digitally, you know, through the uh, these apps that have soaked up vast amounts of consumer data from around the world. You know, I think if the four countries begin acting in, in some non-military ways in a coordinated fashion, uh, that augments our voice. You know, if each of us move on these things unilaterally without underlying agreed upon principles, um, then sometimes it can simply look at, you know, spilled milk and maybe it's pure play commercial interests. But if countries begin acting together in areas like, like uh, you know, digital uh, domination, uh, 5G, of course, you know, we've, we've been trying to do some work to consult each other a little bit more. I think about areas like uh, the principles of research cooperation with China. You know, a lot of universities in the United States, Australia, probably India, have got some level of, level of research partnerships that may be supported directly or indirectly by the Chinese government. And there's growing concerns about that as well. Is that a way for China to get access to, to new ideas and technology? So I think there's a lot of non-military areas too, where these four terrific, great countries uh, might be able to act in coordination that don't even necessarily involve military aspects. So. It's certainly been moving faster. You see operational uh, begin to take off with the uh, joint exercise. I think there's a lot of interesting ways too that are that are not directly military confrontational, where there could be coordination and be very useful. You're talking about technology and now reports of uh, China looking for French uh, nuclear technology as well and looking for uh, Macron to visit, but that's separate. The point that Mr. Rousseau is uh, uh, bringing up, Ambassador, which is not often talked about uh, in, in the military and strategic dimension, and you are of the view that the deep engagement that all countries have with China economically doesn't necessarily have to be cut umbilically. This decoupling that we talk about can be uh, done in certain strategic areas. And we've seen that, say, with 5G, with Huawei, with the, the apps, the uh, technology, right? Yes. Sorry. Uh, what's so the I, I'm asking you about your comments on what Mr. Rosso is saying that other countries can get together no. to uh, look yeah, at I mean, the no, economic no, decoupling. No, if you look at the uh, statements that were issued uh, uh, by the Quad countries after their meeting in uh, in Tokyo, uh, in the Indian statement, uh, Indian statement, in fact, uh, uh, spells out uh, the various uh, non-military areas. Uh, of a quad cooperation, which include, apart from, of course, the general things about the rule-based uh, order, and uh, uh, and uh, there is also a, a reference to uh, uh, to 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 uh, to uh, connectivity uh, issues, uh, to uh, um, cyber security, uh, to HADR activities. Of course, uh, those were uh, mentioned. Uh, 
So the broader areas in which the four countries can cooperate uh, with each other as part of Quad uh, beyond the military have been spelt out. And, and India believes in that, that there is a great potential for these countries uh, to go beyond that and simply restricting it to some kind of a military agenda will do disservice uh, to Quad and that should not be the purpose of, 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 uh, of Quad. Uh, there is also a reference to uh, uh, supply chains in uh, in critical areas uh, moving yeah. the, this way. Uh, but the other issue that was mentioned about uh, the problems that uh, we face with China, uh, this decoupling, total decoupling is not going to happen. It's very clear. Uh, it's not possible. But, what can, but it is enough if, for example, uh, there is uh, there is this decoupling in, in so far as critical supply chains are concerned. If, for example, access to technology is restricted, uh, the Chinese efforts to uh, invest in, uh, in, in, in critical technology areas in the West, uh, if, uh, if that is uh, subject to uh, monitoring. The United States has already with the COFI has done that, but the Europeans are also moving uh, in, in that uh, direction after the Chinese bought, bought over a very important German robotics uh, firm. Uh, similarly, uh, in terms of uh, 5G, which in fact is very, very important because 5G then covers a whole lot of related technologies which will begin to govern how not only countries function, but also how societies function. And uh, China is, uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, taking out enormous amount of data, enormous amount of data. So the whole issue of, uh, of uh, preventing this uh, uh, unbridled data flow to China uh, has also to be uh, has also to be addressed. There is then the whole issue of uh, uh, trying to give alternative to all those countries where China's BRI has made tremendous impacts, which yeah. means uh, which means uh, like the blue dot blue dot network or some other uh, forms of uh, connectivity, which takes into account uh, uh, you know the debt issue and uh, this transparency and general finance and everything else. It is in all these countries, areas that the four countries uh, can very usefully cooperate, apart from the military dimension. Right. Uh, Mr. Rosa, just uh, bringing up what happened in the 2 plus 2 and uh, when there was a joint statement by two secretaries and uh, the defense and external affairs minister, they brought up a cooperation of in third countries as well. India, US in third countries. Would they be referring to what uh, Ambassador Sibyl is talking about, uh, alternatives to the BRI? Because then we saw what happened with the Mike Pompeo going to Sri Lanka, Maldives, Indonesia, and Vietnam. Yeah, they very much would like to. Uh, I, I think that you know we began uh, talking about this global partnership uh, going back, you know, several administrations here in the United States and in India as well. Uh, I think some of the countries uh, and areas that regions that we had circled back in those days for cooperation. Like Southeast Asia and Africa, you know, you've seen some nascent uh, areas for cooperation. But I think, you know, as, as Prime Minister Modi take, took office six years ago and realizing, you know, how deeply China had become ingrained in India's own neighborhood, in the Indian Ocean and the South Asia region, I think it's taken a little bit, a little while for the United States to kind of recognize what India certainly did early on, which is, um, you know, there, there's a brand new pivot point where uh, China is making inroads, and and frankly, you know, most of the American strategic community had not been paying nearly as much attention to what's been happening in the South Asia region as we had been, say, in, in the South China Sea or East China, and even across the uh, the Central Pacific, where you know China's also made inroads in building up ties with some of these uh, island nations across the uh, the Pacific. So I think it's, yeah. it's taken a while to see the United States kind of wake up to the fact that um, you know the Indian Ocean region is also uh, very much being contested today. You see increased presence by the PLA Navy, you see, uh, and most significantly into your question, you know, you see China investing in strategic infrastructure, ports in particular, um, which, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, could give them a toehold and the ability to resupply and carry out long-term missions uh, in the Indian Ocean. And and that is something that we certainly don't want to see. Um, we'd like to see the Indian Ocean continue to be a place of free and open commerce. Um, we don't want to see it become militarized the same way that the South China Sea has become recently. That's good for nobody's interest there. So it is fascinating that, um, you know, frankly, a lot of the ways that, uh, frankly, the United States could be more involved in the region isn't necessarily through a larger military presence in the Indian Ocean, 
but actually uh, becoming more competitive in competing for some of these strategic investments that countries want to see. Now, some of them are non-viable. Some of them are financially not viable. And therefore, yeah. no matter what we throw at it, between our government, between our private sector, um, it's going to be very difficult to make those things uh, operational. But for those that are, are potentially uh, uh, fin financially viable, that uh, the private sector could get involved in, um, you know, sometimes it involves uh, countries that are working together, you know, to increase the viability uh, of, of certain projects across the region. So having countries like India, like the United States, like Australia, Japan, and others cooperating um, to make sure that the infrastructure, strategic infrastructure can be more viable for global commerce, um, these are not insignificant approaches that we can make. So I think the U.S. aperture is finally uh, opening to the Indian Ocean and uh, strategic infrastructure makes a lot of sense for that area. Uh, U.S. aperture opening up to the region. Just appreciating some of our, our viewers, Anurag Bari has put up a super sticker. Thanks, uh, Anurag. And also one of the points that you are raising, AK asks, uh, will the U.S. build a base in the Maldives? The last time in 2013, India didn't entertain this decision. This is, of course, referring to the SOFA agreement in 2013, which India wasn't happy with. And subsequently, the strategic uh, framework which the U.S. and the Maldives have signed, and there is more agreement uh, there, which India is not averse to because of the circumstances. Ambassador Sibyl, uh, Mike Pompeo's visit post the 2 plus 2 to Sri Lanka and then Maldives, Indonesia, and Vietnam. In Sri Lanka, again, we saw the message very loud and clear from the Americans uh, about China. But Sri Lanka saying that it's neutral, it's, it doesn't want to get caught in between two stools of the great powers. The Maldives also indicating that. Uh, how do you see the American new push? It, this uh, base that is being talked about in this question is actually they're just announcing that there'll be a resident ambassador in the Maldives. Well, so your views on Mike Pompeo's visit to uh, the other South uh, Asian and then um, Indo-Pacific nations? Well, a couple of points. One is that uh, uh, I have always felt that the whole Indo-Pacific concept was too heavily tilted in favor of the Western Pacific and not enough in terms of uh, in the Indian Ocean, uh, where uh, India is facing increasingly a major challenge from China because of the so-called maritime silk route and, uh, the, and, and the uh, concrete uh, achievements that they have made in, uh, in Sri Lanka in particular and in Maldives before there was a change in government, in Bangladesh and in Pakistan uh, and in Myanmar. Uh, so I was uh, always of the view that, uh, the, that the United States must put in its diplomatic effort in these countries also to veer them away from dependence on China. Uh, because these countries have been playing the China card against us yeah. for a long time. Mm -hmm. And India has not been able to uh, deal with that because India's relative financial power uh, is limited uh, and also because we are the direct neighbor, uh, there is always this propaganda, the big brother has no neighbor and this and that. But if a country like the United States with all its uh, diplomatic, uh, political and economic power and its global reach comes and puts this bait here and, and try to balance the situation vis-a-vis -vis China, it is very helpful to Indian, uh, Indian interests. Uh, because the Indian India US relationship has been transformed. So why should we worry about the United States being more active in the region? That's one. The other is that I don't think the United States is looking for this in the Maldi War for they have yeah, this, exactly. they yeah. think they will policy yeah, which fulfills all the needs that the Americans have. And uh, yeah. the fact that they've signed a defense agreement uh, also means that uh, uh, the Maldivian government will not be able now so easily and in fact, will not be able to give uh, the Chinese uh, defense assets in uh, in Maldives as they've been trying to uh, trying to grab uh, until they were the in government. So this is a very good thing. In terms of Sri Lanka, uh, I think uh, a, a, a stronger U.S. effort would be very helpful because Sri Lanka has gone far too much uh, into the into a dependency mode on Sri Lanka with hundred year lease of hundred quota. Port and development of the Colombo port and the Colombo and the city and the port around the city and all that means that the Chinese uh, fingers into Sri Lanka with even deeper. Uh, so that process has to be stopped. But Sri Lanka is very adept at playing this non-aligned card, and uh, 
And I'm not surprised that they said this uh, when uh, Pompeo was there, uh, because they'll benefit from both sides. Of course, they'll have to limit. They'll have to place limits on China's penetration, but they will ba balance that by getting more from the United States of America, and, and for that matter, uh, from India. And the fact is, uh, I quite thank you, that in our own joint statement uh, with Pompeo, China has not mentioned. Mm. Yeah. But it is very clear, if you look at the context of everything that is said, that China is looming very large, and it is China that is, that is uh, the context. So if India hesitates, and if Japan hesitates, and if Australia, there is a big debate about which side is United, uh, Australia should go, should it put all its eggs in the, eggs in the American basket or keep its uh, eggs in China too. It's natural for Sri Lanka also to uh, make this kind of statement because they have to be very careful about the impact of all this on their relationship with China. I mean, they, they have to be careful. About it. Uh, so they... they so I suppose, because the relationship has become pretty deep and they are, there is dependency. So I, but the important point for me is that the process has begun of checkmating China's penetration around us. It may take time. Mm -hmm. It's not going to, China's not, to, not going to be checkmated so easily. It will fight, fight back. But the process has begun and that process is helpful. And America is playing, will play a role in this. Uh, process of uh, checkmating China. Mr. Rosa, do you agree with that? And just let me take another question from uh, viewer Tanoj Abe Khanna, who says, is economic decoupling actually happening between US and China? Uh, is there more likelihood of China offering the new administration a better deal and to continue the relationship by presumably is referring to uh, a change in uh, the White House uh, occupancy? Yeah. Um well, decoupling certainly is happening, and some of that was happening, you know, even before COVID. There's really kind of three sort of uh, waves that you've seen so far. You know, the first wave was uh, simply because uh, manufacturing in China had become more expensive, uh, especially for the industries that um, that really utilize labor as a primary uh, tool for, for manufacturing. Uh, China's labor costs had already begun to uh, far exceed those of, of other markets that have, you know, good infrastructure and some of the other factors like Vietnam and Mexico. So you began years ago to actually see uh, manufacturing investment in China begin to uh, to dial down. Then, of course, with uh, President Trump and the concerns about our trade deficit and other things, um, really trying to uh, initiate a trade fight against China, which, um, you know, it, it is real, it is tangible. There's been higher customs duties and, and other threats that have been made. And that's caused a lot of companies as well to, to rethink China's importance in their global supply chains. And then third is through COVID, which, uh, you know, once again, if, if companies over relied on China, um, and you see lockdowns that are directly impacting if you've got way too much reliance on one single country for production. So you've seen these three kind of waves. Now, I also don't want to overplay how much decoupling has happened so far. You know, China still is the base of manufacturing for a lot of global production in critical industries around the world. So decoupling is happening, but it's a very slow process because, you know, those, those hundreds of millions of uh, hundreds of billions of dollars that have been put into China for manufacturing over the last recent decades you know, that's not going away. I mean, you don't see American companies, uh, to, to what I've seen, closing down factories and shifting. But instead, new factories that come up, they're choosing other markets rather than China. So that's been happening. I think, um, you know, overall, um, uh, what would happen with the with the new U.S. administration? Um, I do think that overall, this this more aggressive posture on China, um, I think that would continue to to a large extent. I think you know some of these snap decisions that you see uh, that President Trump has taken. Uh, sometimes completely ignoring the advice of, of counselors and advisors, I think that's likely to slow down. Um, but I do think overall, you know, when we see some of the threats that China poses on, on American workers, on trade, on strategic technologies, but also the fact that during this period, you know, when we've been more aggressive on China, has China slowed down its own aggressiveness? No, it's actually increased. Even in the middle of COVID, um, with Hong Kong, with Uyghurs, with, with the border with India, uh, threats against Taiwan, militarization of the South China Sea. China has actually struck out more aggressively, you know, as we try to dial up the pressure rather than choosing this as a moment to try to rebuild ties with the United States. So I, I think overall you may see um, some slight uh, differences in the approach, maybe maybe not as verbally aggressive in things. But, um, you know, going back to the Obama administration, when they announced the idea of uh, the pivot, the rebalance towards Asia, I, I know everybody was sort of hoping for a little bit more concrete detail on that, what that would mean, um, some Marines at Darwin based, um, you know, a slow revision and, and more reliance on capital and goods going to Asia. But 
you know, this has crossed over a couple of administrations, and now that you've seen a, a little bit sharper tack taken, I don't think that's going to change too dramatically. So the language may be dialed down a little bit, but I think the posturing and the development of partnerships um, across the region, I think that's going to continue no matter who wins this uh, this coming election. Um, as a simple, uh, India and the U.S., and we saw what happened in the 2 plus 2, is taken so long for things like Becca to materialize, to actually be signed. Do you also agree with Mr. Rosso that uh, maybe the language or the, the nomenclature of uh, the White House, if there's a change in the occupancy, will uh, probably be toned down, but there will be no difference in terms of uh, taking on China? Well, I think uh, the American uh, strategists, uh, the American, uh, you know, whoever are the decision makers in Washington, D.C., uh, don't come to the conclusion for whatever reason that China is not a long term threat, then that would speak very poorly <laughs> of uh, their long term thinking. So there's no way. Because, because Xi Jinping has made his ambitions clear with timelines. By 2030, we'll we do this. By 2035, we'll do this. By 2049, we'll be on top of the world. And their thinking is very hierarchical. It's a middle kingdom complex. And he's very aggressive about it, as has uh, been brought out that his aggression has actually become even more visible uh, in, in recent years. Uh, so, uh, the one point that I would like to make is that it will be extremely short sighted of uh, US to make it offer the rest of the world, even the Europeans, uh, to believe that. Uh, they should uh, somehow find ways and means to continue to cooperate with uh, uh, China, if not at the same level, at a pretty high level, uh, even now. The reason I'm saying this is that the more e economic strength to, to give to China, mm -hmm. the more politically uh, problematic they become. Because it is the economic strength that China has acquired as a result of the uh, United States and, and its allies investing in China and building China economically that has resulted in the Chinese Communist Party becoming the monster that it is. So their political ambitions, their whole uh, authoritarianism, which they want to now export to the rest of the world, and the strategic thinking behind the BRI complex is as a result of China's economic rise pulled by the West. Therefore, some way has to be found uh, to actually delink the global economy from China as much as possible. It is not going to stop uh, China from rising or stay putting on his ambitions, but it will slow China down. And when China slows down, it, hopefully it will behave better. And hopefully its internal system will begin to open up. Of course, that is a speculation. But the central point is please don't feed the Chinese economic machine because their political mm -hmm. machine will become more and more dangerous for the rest of the world. That's the same point that uh, Mr. Rosa also brought up earlier in terms of uh, the economic strength. I'm just going to take a question from Sankal uh, Dravid, who says, why aren't the Quad countries putting collective efforts to give credence to finance or sponsoring frameworks like the Blue Dot to counter the CCP's debt-driven uh, diplomacy in the Indo-Pacific? I mean, the larger question of what uh, Master Sibyl is bringing up here of uh, slowing down any kind of aggressiveness by uh, cutting off, if not cutting off completely, but at least uh, turning down the faucet for uh, the money going into China. Mr. Russell. Well, it's, uh, I think that steps are being taken, but it is still relatively nascent. You know, part of the problem, uh, Japan, of course, has a, has a tremendously large development bank, uh, as well as, uh, you know, a, a primary role with the Asian Development Bank. So, you know, they've got tools at their disposal. Australia has a little bit less resources to bring to bear. And until recently, the United States uh, government did not have much of a development development bank to speak of. Though, you know, this year with the creation of the Development Finance Corporation, you know, we can become a little bit more active player in, in some of the regional infrastructure games. So uh, the Quad countries, um, you know, that is one of the areas that uh, they're trying to feel their way towards some type of cooperation. But it is tough to get four countries to to act and work simultaneously. And one of the biggest problems, you know, that we see here from the United States, you know, is is frankly the the biggest value that we can bring to the table is probably at the end of the day going to be our private sector. And, and the private sector looks at a lot of these projects that China has been looking at and investing in and sees that they're simply not investment worthy. Um, you know, the, the thing that I sort of joke with is that unless part of your return on investment is voting against China in a UN vote or something, you know, you're just not going to be a player 
in the returns that you would get on some of these kind of investments. So, you know, for China, a lot of what they hope to accrue from these investments is certainly off the financial balance sheet, which is definitely not going to be true for the U.S. private sector, and to a large extent won't be true for the U.S. Uh, for U.S. government money. They want to make sure that you know there is at least some level of commercial return, and a lot of these projects don't have. Now, with the Blue Dot Network, which again is still relatively nascent. To go and say that certain projects actually have real commercial viability, that uh, contracting uh, rights in that country are actually fair and transparent, so global companies can compete pretty effectively. You know, again, these are these are nascent steps, but I think in in terms of the the tools we can bring to bear, if we focus more on using a little bit of money to unlock the U.S. private sector, you know, for the U.S. contribution as a quad member, that's probably where the biggest bang for the buck's going to come from. So it's going to take a little.